Good morning. My name is Steven Sletten, and I'm a Senior System Security Engineer with Tripwire. And today, I want to tell you how you can protect your organization from ransomware. There are some basic controls that you may already have that can help you. Let's take a quick look at the history of ransomware. In 1989, the first known ransomware was introduced called PC Cyborg. This was spread via diskette in the mail. It sat idle until you rebooted 90 times, then would activate and hide directories, scramble and encrypt the names of all files on your C drive, and then demand a payment of 189 US dollars to unlock the system. Later, in 2006, GP Code was introduced. It spread via email and targeted and encrypted all kinds of documents, graphics, compressed files and spreadsheets across all your hard drives. It also deposited a file on each encrypted directory containing instructions on how to submit your payment. 2013 saw the first crypto locker. It spread via email and via the Zeus botnet. It's installed under a user profile on Windows and added a registry entry causing it to run at startup. It established command and control communications, which generated a key pair and then asked for payment via money pack, Ucash, or Cash U vouchers, as well as Bitcoin, believed to have extorted a total of around three million US dollars. Twenty fourteen saw Crypto Locker two point and that's a copycat. It spread via email and USB drives and accepted Bitcoin payment. It encrypted files using a different mechanism, but still talked to a command and control server. And it encrypted media files as well as documents. 2014 saw the introduction of CryptoWall. And CryptoWall 1.0 through 4.0 is still out there today. And this is ransomware on steroids. It's distributed versus various exploit kits spam campaigns, and malvertising techniques. It exchanges encryption keys with command and control networks, and it's very clever at hiding the URLs. Uh, Tor is used to serve ransom, notification, and service, allowing the victims to make payments, find out the status of the payment, get one free decryption, and create support requests even uses multiple encryption algorithms, and it's observed using undocumented API calls to find the local language settings of the compromised host for better command and control upgrades. It disables and deletes automatic Windows backup mechanisms, and it's polymorphic, meaning it changes, and it uses anti-virtualization and anti-emulation techniques to hide itself. Ransomware has been in the news a lot lately, and for good reason. More organizations are getting hit with ransomware attacks, and some are having to pay up. They might not be doing some of the basic steps to prevent and respond to ransomware attacks. One publication is saying 2016 is the year of ransomware. What steps are you taking to respond to and prevent ransomware? Let's look at the number one way to prepare for and respond to ransomware. Restore from backup. If you're hit with ransomware, the best way to respond is if you've got up-to-the-minute backups, you simply restore from those backups and you're up and running. What happens when that's not possible? Either the data wasn't backed up or the backup was overwritten with encrypted files. That can happen if you have continuous backup cycles and the backups are overwritten after a period of time. So let's look at some other strategies to help you prepare for and respond to ransomware. One of the strategies you might consider to prepare for and respond to ransomware is to leverage your security framework. You may already be using one of these foundational controls, and so you should leverage them. Some examples of controls are the Center for Internet Security Critical Security Controls, the ISO 27000 series, 
the NIST 800-53, FISMA, HIPAA also has controls. The payment card industry standard is another excellent prescriptive type of control, as well as Sarbanes-Oxley or SOX. You may already be using these foundations, and so let's look at how you could leverage those to prepare for and prevent ransomware. Let's take a look how your security controls can be common across the many frameworks. One common area is the inventorying of assets. You must discover what's on your network, compare it to what you think you should have, and see what is extra. You should also be looking at what software is on your network. Another common control is malware defense, being on the lookout for malware, having a system to determine that. Another area is securing configurations and looking for changes on your systems. Secure configuration can mean checking the system to make sure it is locked down per your framework or best practices, and then also looking for changes to that and determining good change from bad. A fourth area of commonality is in the log management area making sure all your logs are centrally gathered and locked down and that they can be audited and secured, as well as an automated way to look through those logs for the needle in the haystack. There are other areas of common security controls across these frameworks. Let's use the Center for Internet Security Critical Security Controls as an example control framework and let's examine what some of those common controls are. The critical security controls are interesting because it's a prioritized list of security controls for best practice. I've highlighted some areas that are common across many of the frameworks, such as the inventory of authorized and unauthorized devices, authorized and unauthorized software, securing the configuration of end-user devices, as well as vulnerability assessment and remediation, maintenance and monitoring and analysis of audit logs, and the last one on the list there is malware defense. So we've looked at that before. Now let's drill in how that can be applied to prevent and respond to ransomware. Let's take a look at how those security controls can help. Critical security controls 3 and 11 are around secure configurations of devices and change management. Change detection can monitor user directories and restrict permissions for suspicious files, either until threat intelligence identifies the file as non-threatening or a security administrator clears the file. System hardening can enforce configuration settings that help prevent or counter infection. Threat intelligence integration can help identify polymorphic malware, that is, malware that's changing signatures all the time. When combined with a next generation firewall, threat intelligence integration can possibly prevent command and control communication. That is crucial to stopping ransomware in progress. Critical security control 6 and 8 are around malware defense and logging. By having a log management system that can also correlate events, you can alert on malware propagation techniques such as brute force logon attempts. You can also alert on file access patterns. Recall that ransomware is encrypting and changing the names on many, many files as quickly as it can. Well, using a correlation, you can look for that pattern and alert before it completes all of that encryption. You can also execute scripts to lock down the system to prevent further propagation, such as killing non-essential processes, locking down communications, such as shutting off firewall, and so on. Critical security controls 1, 2, and 4 are around inventorying of assets and vulnerability management. Vulnerability management is important because you can detect vulnerabilities used by ransomware exploit kits. Ransomware typically targets the oldest vulnerabilities, so you can identify and remediate those first. 
using your vulnerability management system, you can drive remediation of those vulnerabilities with workflow automation. It may be too difficult to implement all three layers at once, but you could implement them a step at a time. So starting on the left with secure configuration servers, that's a good start. By implementing change detection and hardening, you can drive workflow to detect and prevent new executables and other suspicious files. You can configure hardening to enable and enforce configuration settings that prevent or counter infection, and then configure action work workflows to alert security people when suspicious files require investigation. That's a great start. Add another layer by integrating threat intelligence, then you can identify polymorphic malware, and when integrated with next generation firewalls, possibly prevent command and control communication, which is so crucial to ransomware. As a continuation of stage two in the middle there, you can look at adding in log management with correlation. By uh, the ability to correlate events together, you can look at propagation techniques and alert on brute force log on attempts. You can also alert on ransomware file access and patterns. Recall, the files are changing constantly and re being renamed. You can, again, alert and prevent that from completing. You can also lock down the communication and help prevent further propagation. Layering on stage three on the far right with vulnerability management and inventorying of assets, you can detect and drive the workflow to remediate those common vulnerabilities used by ransomware exploit kits. By layering all three of these together, you can heighten your ransomware protection, but you don't have to do it all at once. You can layer them together. Let's take a look at how you could get started for improving your ability to detect and respond to ransomware by integrating secure configuration with threat intelligence. We've been talking about having critical security controls can help you detect and respond to ransomware. Today, we'll take a look at how that works, and as an example, we're going to use Tripwire Enterprise for our secure configuration and change detection example. So, what I'm looking at here is a desktop showing me what's going on in the environment from a security controls standpoint, and I see that there's no user activity on the desktop side, and if I also look at how we've integrated with threat intelligence, I see no malicious change happening over the past few days. As an end user, however, uh, that's not where I work. I'm going to go to my desktop as an end user and begin work. I've stored all of my critical files in this particular directory. Notice I have documents and graphic files and so on and so forth. And I'm browsing the web and wanting to download some additional information. So I'm at a typical website and download a, a, a file. I think it's a document, but I don't notice that it's got a PDF and it's got an EXE extension on it indicating it's actually an executable. Well, I don't notice that. I'm very busy and I miss that. Uh, so I've downloaded it into my download directory, which is typically where downloads from browsers take place by default. And one of the responses that we can do as a change detection and secure configuration control is do real-time detection of executables being added to a system and then prevent them from being executed. So here's an example. I go to open this. I don't notice that it's running the file, not just opening it, and I click on run. Ah, but we get the error saying that Windows has prevented me from running this file. So that's one example of how a secure configuration and change detection control can help you prevent ransomware. Well, as a determined user, I might do some more things, and we'll get back to that here in a second. Uh, 
just uh, let's flip over and look at the security control and what's happened with the change detection and control on the monitoring side. So we see here that we have detected the change. There's been changes on a user desktop and the user has downloaded uh, something to the web downloads directory. So again, uh, you, we, we help prevent the ransomware from executing as well as detecting that there's activity going on. Back into my user mode, what I might do as a determined user is try to get that file anyway. So uh, the system has prevented me and I might put it on a USB stick on my home computer and copy it in or I might try to download it to a different location. So I'm going to try again. And in this time, I'm going to put it in my documents directory. Let's try that. See if that's being uh, uh, monitored and replaced with uh, permissions. So I download it to there and um, go to try to operate on that file here. And again, I can open it and I do run it and I've been hit with ransomware. So this is just an example of what can happen with ransomware. Uh, first, you notice that the desktop color has changed, but also notice that my critical files have all been renamed and encrypted. So this is very typical of many flavors of ransomware is they hide your files, encrypt them, rename them, and then maybe give you some instruction on how to uh, get them unencrypted by paying them. Uh, if we look at the desktop, there's a message here. This is just one example of how this might appear. Uh, since uh, the ransomware is such an easy business model, there are many flavors and it's been sort of rebranded over the years, and so uh, your message won't look like this necessarily. So uh, the, the, the user has been uh, has been attacked and now let's see how the security control is responding. So if we uh, look at the desktop monitoring we do notice that there are many many more changes here. We see over 80 changes. We see uh, uh, stacks of priority. The uh, critical risk and executable and suspicious file count has all gone way up. So on the security control side, we are alerting and indicating that there's a problem on, on that person's system. In addition, we can integrate with threat intelligence and tell you what that uh, malicious activity might be. So here we're going to take a look at what does the malicious activity look like. And so... Um, we see that there has been malicious activity. Uh, we see that here in 2B where ma malicious changes by platform has lit up. Uh, let's take a look at what else we can do there. We can, we can set parameters and indicating what's going on. So we see that that is malicious. We've talked to a threat analysis database and it said that the SHA-1 matched a malicious file. So that's another example how extending secure configuration with change detection and integrating that with a threat intelligence system can help uh, respond to and detect malware. I hope you found this information helpful today, and now I'd like to answer your questions. Please use the Q&A box to ask any question. I'm seeing some questions come in. Uh, here's a great question. How does Tripwire help when the ransomware attack is deployed from within the network by an attacker that has obtained administrative credentials rather than as a result of a phishing or spear phishing attack? That's a great question. 
and the the response from from a tripwire point of view is really that's where we where we help the most we can monitor and detect elevated privilege access and then odd behavior within the network and so that's exactly what we're doing during the uh, uh, during other phases of monitoring and detecting malware type attacks. So uh, thank thank you for that question. Uh, I appreciate that. Let's see. Any other questions? Um, yes, uh, there was a question about uh, the pop up. That uh, when when I made the change to the file and or tried to open the file and there's a pop-up warning, uh, by default, no, that's a Windows pop-up that uh, we are using, uh, leveraging Windows permissions. However, uh, that could certainly be enhanced with uh, additional scripting. So uh, what you saw there was just the default uh, pop-up window, and uh, but that that could definitely uh, be enhanced. Let's see uh, some other questions I'm seeing here. A uh, question about how ransomware is utilized, and um, so the question is: So would ransomware be utilized to disrupt your ability to provide services by converting your files? So the answer to that is yes. That is uh, certainly the common approach to ransomware: is that it uh, encrypts your critical files or maybe all of your files on your on your system. So we we've seen that as a service disruption and uh, the hospital in Los Angeles that was hit by a ransomware. They made the business decision that it was more worthwhile to pay the attacker. Uh, versus uh, suffer through the service disruption from going back and recovering from backup. Uh, let's see, um, it, the, you go on to ask, or is it used primarily as an embarrassment, as in you have to inform your clients that data has been breached? Certainly that's an approach, but I think, I think uh, ransomware is more of a business proposition, and so uh, people aren't looking for headlines, they're looking for cash, they're looking for Bitcoin payment. So uh, I think that's that's the typical motivation. Uh, we're seeing we're seeing a, a services set up to be middle middlemen uh, in the ransomware. There's a there's now a dark web site to accept payment and to give payment to uh, to the attackers to the to the criminals. And so um, I think I think this is definitely more of a business proposition and in obtaining uh, uh, cash so uh, that's uh, that's my response uh, to that question there uh, let's see another good question is there a way to remove ransomware after it's been installed and the, the there are two answers to that one is yes you pay the ransom and you get the key and then you decrypt everything but you're never really sure if it was all decrypted correctly or that uh, it's gone from your system, which most certainly it, they wouldn't just leave your system alone after that. Um, th the only positive way to be sure is to restore from backup. So that's, that's the answer uh, to, to that question. Let's see. Since it is completely difficult, or since it is difficult to completely stop ransomware, is the best line of defense to back up your files on a regular basis. And the answer is absolutely yes. Backup is your uh, first line of defense, and uh, should definitely be part of any uh, security and disaster recovery process. Uh, so yes, is is the answer there. Absolutely uh, use use uh, backup, but 
oftentimes is the case, uh, organizations can't back up every single uh, file on every single critical system, and sometimes there are things that are missed. And so when the ransomware hits, that's when you actually find out that you might not have that. So that's, that's issue number one, that you might not have it on a backup. Um, issue number two with that is the uh, delay to the business to getting back up and running. So to actually go restore from backup uh, often takes a good deal of of time and effort, and so uh, there's there's a risk reward, and then there's a cost benefit to restoring from backup versus, uh, for for example, paying ransomware, and so that that's how I feel like a, a good set of security controls can help in that in between area, and and uh, stop um, stop ransomware perhaps in process or before it gets started uh, in addition to what else is, is going on with your security controls such as your backup, uh, your firewalls, uh, other defenses. Um, but we, we also want to, you know, recommend those SANS or the, the, the CIS top 20 security controls as a prioritized list as a way to to uh, to round out your strategy is understand what's on your network, understand what vulnerabilities are out there on your systems, uh, secure your systems, harden them, uh, detect changes on the systems, do logging and correlation, and so on and so forth. So, um, so the the answer is is. Uh, Backup is certainly a, a, a great part of the defense strategy, but cannot necessarily always be the only part of the defense strategy. Let's see. Um, another another good question. How about um, Mac OS or OS X? Uh, do they get hit? Uh, yes, they, they do. They certainly do get hit. And um, many, many companies offer uh, malware protection and endpoint protection for OS X now, including Tripwire. We have, uh, we have an agent that runs on OS X and can help protect you there and round out your defense strategy and your security controls on OS X. There was confirmed ransomware uh, just in January of this year. Let's see, do network mount drives get affected? Uh, they can be affected. Yes, absolutely. Uh, network, uh, the, the ransomware has various levels of sophistication. Uh, you saw through the history that it's evolved, and uh, so people might be purchasing flavors of ransomware or they might be uh, getting code from earlier versions and then uh, using the less sophisticated mechanisms, but certainly the more sophisticated uh, ransomware techniques uh, can go out to the network drives as well. So, uh, so network uh, mounted drives can certainly be uh, affected. Uh, let's see. Uh, good question about backups. So I mentioned earlier about continuous backup may result in backing up encrypted files, and how do you avoid doing that? Uh, that's a great question. And so that's why you really need a layered approach to, to, uh, to malware and ransomware protection uh, because uh, typically, how continuous backups work is perhaps nightly or daily uh, the system is backed up again uh, and and so if if you got hit during the day and you didn't realize it and now your system was connected to the network and did the nightly backup, for example, now you've taken the the good uh, uh, system and, and overwritten with the bad system. So how can you protect against it? Well, make sure your backup strategy includes a, a rolling set of backups where you have not just one backup that's overwritten, but you have several days' worth of snapshots available, or you have an archive strategy where uh, after a while the backup is is 
is taken out of the, the backup rotation and not written over again. So there are a couple of ideas on the backup. I'm not a backup expert. There are many uh, folks out there that can help uh, address that as well. Uh, just time for one more question here. Um, let's see. Let's see what, uh, there are so many questions. Uh, here's here's the uh, last last question for today. Uh, provided the file is monitored, is it safe to assume that if threat detection feeds identify the hash as a bad file, will it provide the alerting on the dashboard or through event sender? So uh, the question is from uh, an informed user, and uh, that's a great question. So the threat detection feed can do things uh, real time. And it, it, we can react to to the uh, to the bad hash in a real time manner, manner in that we could actually shut off access to that file. We can also alert on the dashboard and through an event generator type uh, type operation where we send a syslog uh, to to another system. So lots of options on how we can respond to that. And uh, that's a great question, speaking to integration with the uh, the whole security uh, set of systems. Um, so we could send alerts through other systems as well. So if you have a security operations center or SOC, uh, that could get the alert as well. Well, thank you for your great questions today. And that's about all the time we have. And for your information, we'll be sending a link to this webcast and I believe emailing the PowerPoint presentation as well. Uh, thanks again and have a great day.